You've already heard from some of the European development finance institutions visiting us in Oslo this week. Now, Oslo is also the seat of a public fund with a significantly bigger portfolio than any of us. Though the mission and the setup are different, we believe we can learn a lot from them, and perhaps they can also learn something from us. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Nikolai Tangen, the CEO of Norges Bank Investment Management. He will be interviewed by my dear colleague, Jova Liedberg, the Executive Vice President for Strategy and Communication in Northland. Now, as they come to the stage, I would like us all to give them a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I'm here with Nikolai, uh, the head of uh, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and as Anne said, a lot more money than we have, around $1.7 trillion, yep. is that right? And owning uh, just north of 1.5% of the world's listed companies. So quite a lot of influence. We're going to talk about strategy, what makes good strategy. Uh, we're also going to talk about how you work to influence the companies that you're invested in. Uh, we're going to talk about leadership, and very importantly, we're going to talk about cooking. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we are. We are. We start with the cooking, perhaps. <laughs> now, uh, I'm a little bit worried because Nikolai, he runs a great podcast called In Good Company. So he's really used to asking questions. So, uh, you know, hopefully here we're going to get some answers as well, Nikolai. Um, we start with the strategy piece. You've been managing money, investing for about 30 years or so. Uh, and probably the easiest or the most difficult question in the world is what goes into setting a clear and successful investment strategy? Yeah, I think um, the first thing is to figure out what are you good at and what are you not very good at, and then just focus in on what you are good at. That is why the whole emerging market piece of what we do, we have outsourced, because we are not very good at it. <clears throat> so we invest in 35 countries, uh, emerging countries, across the world, and we do that through external managers. So nearly 100 external managers. And, and why do we do that? Well, it's just that it's so difficult to navigate these areas. And you, of course, are specialists in what you do. We are not specialists in that part of the world. And when you operate in that many countries, um, with so many different types of shareholders, in terms of government shareholders, big families, and so on, to stay out of trouble, you need local presence. And, um, and so the managers we have basically are invested in only 25% of the companies in the various markets. Mm -hmm. It's been really great for us. It's generated great returns, kept us out of trouble to a very high degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a very good solution for us. And if we uh, just build on your 30 years, so not just the strategy of the fund, and again, back to this, what makes for a great investment strategy, you need to do what you're good at, stay out of the stuff that you're not good at, but what else? I mean, it's all about making choices, right? So yeah. more from a conceptual strategy thinking point of view, how do you design a successful investment strategy? Oh, I, think the two, more things. I think the two, the two main things, one is to be very, very long term, um, which we haven't particularly been. Um, and the other one is to be really contrarian, which we haven't particularly been. Uh, so where does that so leave are, you? So we, <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we, are we are working on it, okay? Um, I mean, long-termism, I think long-termism is becoming more and more of a strength because uh, not many people do it. People are very short-term, increasingly short-term. There is increasingly short-term capital. If you can take a really, really long-term view like you can, mm -hmm. really, really great. Why are we becoming more short-term in general? The whole, the whole market. I mean, the, the biggest growth you're seeing now is in, is in same-day same day options, mm -hmm. right? You buy this, so now it's like... Uh, uh, 11 in the morning, I buy an option and I bet on a price at the 2 in the afternoon. Mm. I, I mean, it's incredible, right? Mm. That's where most of the option volume is these days. And, but what's the underlying driver for more short-termism? Um, well, you know what, I think it uh, has to do with many things, but one is just pace of society. Mm. And I just read a book called The Big Acceleration, and the, uh, one difference between the world 30 years ago and now is that we walk and talk 10% faster. It's unbelievable. Like you measure speed of movement in a city, 
how fast people how pe fast people walk. Mm -hmm. And the same with talk, of course. Mm -hmm. And so the whole world is just moving faster and faster. And that's going to just accelerate with, with AI and all the new technology, I think. You can even see it in films, right? Totally. That it's a totally different speed of both talking and music and sound and everything. I mean, you put on one of your favorites uh, with your kids. I mean, they, they fall asleep within one minute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do. Could also be because you're choosing a bad film, but... Uh... No, never. We'd never do that, right? <laughs> High quality film from the 70s. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Going back to your point about being a contrarian, and I think this is something that you also said in, uh, in the FT uh, a couple of weeks back, that uh, you want to be a contrarian both as an investor and an art collector. So um, you said in investment being long-term might be contrarian. What other things do you think are characterized a contrarian investor? Oh, um, it's very difficult to be contrarian because you have... Uh, everybody disagreeing with you all the time, right? And so you have to have a particular mindset. And you have to be very stubborn, but at the same time, change your mind if the facts change. But to be contrarian, it's very, very tough. You need to be a bit of a loner, uh, not so many friends. Just to be... <laughs> just where, to do be you, used, where do you fit no, in? No, but just to be life. used to be, you know, different. Mm. And... Um, uh, and you know you can be wrong for a long period of time, but that and when you're right, it normally happens very quickly. Mm. So it's a short period of time. You get a burst of uh, of rightness, mm. but then but that those are very profitable. Do you have any examples of that when you've been that sort of loner contrarian and it's been rewarded at the well, end? The big, of your well, the big thing we did in the fund was um, when interest rates were to a certain, to a large degree negative in the portfolio, we shorted the duration, right? So we made the portfolio less. Uh, less kind of susceptible to interest rates increases, and um, we saved a lot of money on that. Mm. Now, there, there are not often you see those type of really great opportunities, but that was one of them. Mm. Um, what could another opportunity be now? Now, I mean, the real estate market, really, really low. Uh, AI technology, probably really high. Mm. Okay. So I don't know whether that's going to correct in a year or two, but probably in a five-year view, uh, it could be an interesting trade. I mean, we haven't, we haven't really done it, right? But if you think about it. Now, I know you, you run NBIM and not Norfund, uh, so feel free to say you can't answer it. But if you were to point out a way in which a DFI could be contrarian, what might that be? Um, I think you want to look at something. Well, for instance, the uh, renewable energy sector. <clears throat> we got that into mandate, into our investment mandate in 21. The market was really, really hot, okay? Everybody went in there uh, in, in the Western world. Uh, pension funds had too little uh, of that type of exposure. Huge competition for all the tenders. Yeah. Returns extremely low. And we kind of held back and didn't really invest a lot in the beginning. So you have to stay out of the markets when they are that competitive. And then now the returns are higher for many reasons, right? You have had the ESG backlash, you had a lot of things happening. Um, then you should um, deploy a bit more capital and kind of lean forward a bit. So it is to kind of just read the cycles a bit and do the opposite of everybody else. How easy is it to be a contrarian when you are the head of a state-owned fund, you know, a civil servant? Uh, that's a very good point. I mean, um, uh, it's very difficult. It, it, I mean, the thing is that it's very difficult to be contrarian, full stop, because if you have clients and you don't make money because you are a contrarian, they redeem, they take the capital out. Mm. If you're head of a state institution and you have too much deviation from your benchmark, you're going to get the sack. Mm. So it's tough. Mm. So, you, so the important thing is it, what you do needs to be extremely well anchored with your governance structure. Mm. You know, it needs to be accepted by uh, the people you report to. And so we really uh, anchor this very closely with the Ministry of Finance. And so we have kind of pre-agreed what type of tracking error and, and deviation from benchmark we can tolerate. Mm. So getting buy-in and understanding and, 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 from and, your owner. And, and, and I think it's really interesting because when you are in a situation like that, I, know, I think I know how much we can lose more than the benchmark before I get the sack, okay? Uh, how much is that? No, I think... <laughs> no, but, and, and, and I know it because we have, we have predestined uh, tracking errors that they will accept, right? Mm. So you probably can lose, uh, well, actually, I should be a bit careful because there is some media here. But, um, <laughs> but the problem, you see, the, the reason why you need to have a benchmark, which you follow pretty closely in these type of funds, is that the numbers are so big. If you lose much more money than your benchmark, you will lose your job at the wrong point 
in time. And what happens then? They liquidate your positions, they lock in your losses, and you will never get them back, okay? So that's why you need to tie people uh, uh, like us a bit to the mast. Mm. And it's a bit similar to us, right? I mean, we have a state owner as well, and anchoring our strategy and for them to understand what we do, why we do what we do, and having a, an acceptance for the kind of risks we take. That's also imperative for us yep. in the same way. Uh, you are mostly an index uh, investor, uh, and you own, as we said initially, a small share of most of the world's companies. Uh, but still, you have a pretty active strategy for engagement, so working to influence those companies. Yeah. Now, how do you, so we, we've talked about this as no, in Norfund as well, we hold much larger shares mostly, you know, 30, 35%, but we are still a little bit reluctant to speak of ourselves as, as active, because we are still a minority investor. So my question to you is, how are you working with companies when you have such a small share uh, to really influence them in the direction that you think is uh, most valuable and most suitable? Yeah, so big difference between being active and activist. We are not activists, mm. but we are active. Mm. And active means that you have a dialogue with the companies in which you are invested. Mm. And we have that all the time. Like last year, we had some 3,000 meetings, very active uh, dialogue. Then we are active through our voting. We vote at more than 100,000 proposals every year, 10,000 AGMs. Mm. <clears throat> and that's really fascinating because we have automatically, we have got one and a half percent of all the votes in the world. Mm. But given the, the work we put into our voting decisions and the fact that we now pre-announce our votings means that we have another three percentage points which follow our voting. And I suspect <laughs> it's getting bigger. So we, we have nearly, we nearly influence 5% of all the votes in the world. Mm. Well, 5% is that much or not so much? Well, you know what? It's a lot mm. because the, the shareholder structures are so fragmented. When does it work the best, your engagement? Can you give an example of when it's really worked? Well, it works the best, but nobody hears about it, right? Um, mm. When you do it behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. which we do all the time. Mm. But, it, but um, some things work. You know, we can see that the, peop the, the companies we engage with on the climate side, they, more of them have climate goals than the ones we haven't actively mm. engaged with. And so therefore we have picked you know, um, several hundred companies which have the biggest, uh, which are the biggest polluters and we focus in on those. Um, we have been successful on diversity at board levels and now for instance in Japan we are seeing big movements partly because of the work we've done. Now we've not been successful on executive pay mm. in America in particular. Right. And what, do you, what do you do then when you're not successful? What are the implications of that? We continue, we continue to work on it. Uh, I would say the two things which is not r moving very fast. One is, one is executive pay, and the other one is the split of role between the chair and the CEO. Mm. We think that's really important for a good governance structure. Mm. Um, now, it has improved from something like 40% 10 years ago to 30% 30% now, so it's moving, but it's moving pretty slow. Mm. Now, when it comes to executive pay, I'm, uh, you know, I think we need to be a bit humble because who are we sitting in Oslo and deciding executive pay in America? I mean, you know, you, you have to be a bit humble about it. Mm. Um, so there we look at not necessarily the levels, but we look at the structures. It should be long term, it should be tied to uh, performance of the company and so on. That's the important thing. So about the structure and what it drives rather than the actual levels necessarily. Yeah. 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 Uh, Changing tack slightly and uh, more over to the sort of the leadership side of things or a more personal angle, which is, uh, I read in an interview that you gave a couple of weeks ago that you said, I love friction. Wow. And I'm tempted to agree, but I'd also like to ask you, what kind of friction do you love? When and what kind of friction? Well, you, uh, it, it needs to be constructive friction, right? And what does uh, that look like? Well, that you discuss, uh, you discuss topic and you disagree on, uh, on arguments. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be personal. I don't, I don't like personal friction, mm. but, but we must be able to agree, uh, no, to disagree on things. Mm. And that's the, um, that's the problem now. It's, um, there, there are a lot of things which there is very little debate about. Very many CEOs don't want to be in the, kind of in the public debate. Mm. And what are we worried about debating, do you think? Why they... What, what are we, I mean, if we're CEOs, but also others, that we are worried about debating, we're worried about the friction? I think we are worried about debating most things, actually. Yeah. Why is that? Um, well, there, there, are, there are many reasons for that. Um, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough climate. It's a tough... Uh, 
it's a tough media climate. Um, it's, it's just a tough climate. What can we do to create more constructive friction? By being more conscious about it, by, um, ha by making sure you have better discussions in-house, in uh, you know, at your board, at your leader group level, and so on. If we bring it also into sort of corporate culture, and, uh, and I know you've talked a lot about culture in Endem, how to be, build a good culture. How, would you, how do you work to bring that kind of constructive friction into the culture of, of the bank? Well, there are many different ways, but it, it, it goes from everything, how you conduct uh, the leader group meetings, uh, how you hear people out, um, um, you know, taking a bit more risks uh, in terms of projects you start. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the great thing is if you start a project and you don't know whether it's going to be good or bad, you call it the pilot, okay? Because the <laughs> pilot, is, <laughs> pilot is, pretty, is pretty okay. I mean, it doesn't work, you just shoot it down. You know, the, the podcast you mentioned, we started as a pilot. Yeah. Now it's, uh, I think it's three times as big as the number two podcast, uh, the business podcast in the country, right? Yeah. And so you just start these things as pilots and you see how they go. Yeah. I promised that we'd talk about cooking as well. Because uh, you've said, um, that, well, you've said you have a few passions. Uh, and I know one is art and one is cooking. Yeah. Uh, and... One might say that cooking requires both talent, experience, but also putting together the right ingredients into making a single perfectly cooked dish. How many people here cook? People who cook are nicer people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they just are nicer people. They enjoy life more, they have more love. What do you think comes first, though? Do, Nice people cook, or do people who cook become nice? No, the, the first, the first. First? <laughs> nice people cook. So if you're not a nice person, you can't become one by cooking? I don't think so. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> but, uh, no, but you know what, we talk, you know, we, we talk about uh, making investments in places outside your own country. I mean, the way that sharing food, I mean, sharing food, what that does to, to people, I mean, it's incredible. It's a bit like sharing a sauna in Finland. That does something to you as well. <laughs> But apart from that, it, it, it is just amazing, you know, family meals, friends, it, it's just absolutely wonderful. And I think that uh, in a world which is moving faster, you know, more machines, all these kind of things, we, can, we just need to get back to that sometimes. What is a memorable food sharing experience for you? Well, I have them all the time, you know. But an example. <sighs> you know, family and friends, you have your family on a Sunday dinner and people laugh and tell stories, it's wonderful. So it's not your 15 course Michelin no, no, star no, no, restaurant? No, no, no. I kind of think, yeah, the world is going a bit away from that. It's yeah. into more casual dining and more fun, you know. Mm. Any parallels between cooking and investing? You know, the experience, the talent, the ingredients, how to put things together, maybe being slightly contrarian? No, I, I don't think you need to be contrarian and put kind of awful stuff in there. I don't think that's good. <laughs> But it is, it is about, being, uh, it's about being systematic, uh, uh, trying some new things, and you are never better than your last pancake. And that's a bit the same with investing, right? Okay. It's really, you know, you, your results, you are just never better than your last results. Mm. And if you look um, sort of in, into, into the future going forward, do you think investing will look similar as it has done over the last few years, or will it be fundamentally different? Um, I think um, I think you'll have you'll have a big part of the investment universe, which is just going to be automated machine learning uh, and so on. And then I think you will have uh, clever long-term fundamental pockets, which are going to be very interesting. And I think you are going to make a lot of money there. And I hope that we will make money there too. And you, F. Fonda, will also make a lot of money there. But um, so I, th I think I think it will po polarize even more. <clears throat> now, it means that the passive uh, investing, uh, that capital pool will not use its votes, they will not have a meaning, they will not have a responsibility. The responsible investing pool will be even more important, even more important in kind of setting the preferences and the priorities in capital markets. Um, it's very, very important. So that's about uh, asset classes and investment styles. What about in terms of geographies? Will it look different there? I, um, so that's a very uh, tough question because uh, the world is polarizing now. Mm. And um, 
so, so that's really tough. I think it depends on how much it polarizes. Um, but the development of the last few years have been, have been, it's been pretty worrisome, right? Yeah. 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 And how does that influence how you think about the work of uh, NBIM going forward? The fact that it's so polarized, it's uh, full of conflict, all the things that we've heard about earlier today. Yeah, so far, so far it hasn't have any big impacts on how we allocate the capital. Mm. <clears throat> we have roughly half the money in the US and then a big portion in Europe and then the rest kind of spread uh, in the rest of the world. So it hasn't really impacted. I think when you look at the polarization, also, what is, what is new just over the last couple of years is how technology is driving the polarization. And uh, <clears throat> you look at the access to you know, microchips and how microchips is being now embedded in, in um, pretty much all the rivalry in the world. So it's embedded in weapons, it's embedded in medical research, self-driving cars, all these kind of things. And so that whole link with, between technology and geopolitical tension that's a new phenomenon over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and I'm not seeing that going away. No. So there are some clouds on the horizon. Um, there may be some changes in investment styles going forward. Long-termism, patience, being a contrarian is key. But I think the most important takeaway is, uh, you know, folks like us, cooks, we're just nicer people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nikolai. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.